Right. Hi guys. So, I'm Vizo and I'm going to talk about Turbo. Oh, Vizo. Yeah. So, Turbo Scheme. So, the logo you see here was actually drawn by some guy in the RCA, Greg Christensen, in another journal. Okay, so, what is Turbo? Well, Turbo is a scheme dialect, above all, that is a state of the art micro modeling system. So, it was inspired by Racket because they have some amazing technology when it comes to metamodularity. But Racket is strictly, it's mostly an academic project and it's hard to write code that actually runs efficiently on your servers or on your phones or anything else. So, Drupal was created with Racket inspiration on top of Gambit because I love Gambit. And so, what was the, uh, can you say a bit about the Racket inspiration? Yeah, Racket has amazing metamodularity features. So, mm -hmm. the micro module system are very nice. And it allows you to do things like change the service index, have modules being imported at various phases of the metasyntactic tower, you can change the language in yeah. ways that are not possible in normal scheme. So we've replicated all of this and it's running on top of Gambit. So now we have this kind of functionality running on Gambit right now. Okay. Can you mention what makes it opinionated? Yes, what makes it opinionated? So there are certain design choices. Not making things for, for carrying my opinions or the rest opinions. Basically, for example, the modeling system is <coughs> greatly inspired by a AFDF. So there are standards, and we like to implement standards, but I don't like to go by other people's standards, as I say. So if I like something or if you like something, we do it that way without trying to be openly compatible with each other's systems. We don't care so much about being compatible with how other people are doing things. We have certain opinions about how things should be done. We have a nice, pleasant, practical, and productive language. So, before I get into the details, in the talk, mostly I'm going to focus on the micro module system, and I'm going to walk through right, quite a bit of code so that you see what the Gerbil looks like, and we're going to run a little bit of a demo. But you know, when you download Gerbil or when you install Gerbil, you get the Gerbil distribution. This includes the core language, but it includes an extensive standard library. Has lots of stuff that you need to track your programming. So it's not naked like Gambit, which tries to be minimal. We, we try to be you know, like a bigger language. So one way to think about it is like Gambit is C and Gerbil is C plus plus and Dog. That's what uh, that's how I like I like to put it. So of course, being opinionated doesn't mean we don't support actual standards. We do support actual standards. We do have R seven RS, which is small. We have the Perlu. So, since we are a multi-dialect, a meta-dialect that allows you to change the semantics of the base language, we can do that. We can have an R7 RS per loop, and you can run R7 RS code, which will, it will interface with the rest of the gerbil system seamlessly, and after you compile it, you have Gambit, then you can just interact, have these modules, and you can import them into Gambit as normal Gambit code. So, we also have R7 RS large, one of the goals is to have our seven RS large as part of the distribution. So we're still in a red edition. I'm going to be working into the Tanzer edition, you know, probably next week or something like that. So that's no biggie. And we're one of the few schemes that actually supports our seven RS large. So, yes. What, what's the thing with the colors? Like what's red, what's the green? Oh, this is the, the naming convention that they're using in the in the R7 RS large project. So there's they split it into different tokens that say, okay, red defines this kind of these libraries, Tangerine defines a different set of libraries, and instead of doing versions or whatever naming, they're doing colors. Okay. That's but, okay. And, and does it go from like red to green or well it <laughs> will go to green eventually <laughs> because currently it's only Tangerine. Okay. Yeah, you, you can check out the R7 RS process and the R7 RS large process. So I would say, you know, like, we don't like R6 RS because it imposed too much structure on the language and it made it, you know, fossilized the uh, common place. R7 RS is much nicer because it's much less intrusive, it's much simpler to implement the R7 RS core, which is R7 RS small. And then there's a set of libraries that are surfaced that provide the REST functionality for our 7 rs large. So this is a model that we like, so we will support our 7 rs large. Okay. Okay, so observable modules. So as I said, one of the main features of 
Gerbil is a micro module system, so it's a metamodular language. <coughs> and the fundamental unit of computation in Gerbil is the module. So we don't have a file, we have a module. And you know, but because it's an ASDF system, modules are transparently mapped to files with the file system. And you can have nested modules inside files, and you can have modules in the interpreter, but the fundamental thing, because we're a combined language, combined language primarily, of course we have an excellent interpreter from Kumar, but you know, like, we compile things through files. So it's module, it has a prelude, and it has a definition that includes. So the prelude provides initial bindings. So the R7RS prelude provides the bindings that are present in R7RS. The gerbil prelude provides a different set of primitives that includes you know, a whole bunch of stuff and lots of macros as we're going to see. Okay, so modules export bindings to extend so that you can import these modules and you can extend your namespace with functionality. This includes macros, stuff that run higher at higher levels for the metasyntactic tower, all of that. And modules, of course, can import other modules to extend your namespace. So, Let's look at how a module looks like in Gerbil. So I'm gonna start with a module in the standard library, which is one of my favorite libraries. This is the HTTP client, which is the request library. Okay, so each module has a package. I should, know, I should note that because this is the standard library and we define the packages with a, with a directive, but you can have a gerbil.package file. Hey, excuse me, Kate. Can, can you do something to your screen so that we see the, the very can first characters? Can we move the... Uh, I don't think it's... No, 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 Just move the... I move the projector and... Just move the window a bit. Can we move the window? Your window monitor because we're getting up. No, my window monitor is... No. Red poison. Red poison, nothing to make that work. Then there we go. Isn't that Emacs? Yes, the same split, split it vertically. Split it vertically. Yes. X four. X three. And what do we do with this? Huh. Where is the? Where is size? I don't want to try to. Okay. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Yes. Right. Oh, right. That's much better. A for Emacs. <laughs> 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 Which is a window manager after all things. <laughs> so this is important. Its module is part of the package. So you can ignore the package if you want, but then the symbols are gonna so the package defines the namespace for the module. So we don't do this automatically like thing like schemes like says scheme where you write something in your library and you have no idea what the actual symbol name is down, you know, like in the scheme system. Here it's under the programmer control and you say where in this package and the namespace of the module can be constructed by the package and the name of the file. Okay, so, and as I said, this declaration can be, uh, doesn't need to be present in every module. You can define a gerbil.pkg file that defines, you know, like your package in the hierarchy together with the prelude and other things. But because it's the standard library, we don't have a gerbil.pkg in there, so just put it here. <coughs> so, this is the module, it has a bunch of imports. Here it, in, it imports a bunch of symbols that are jump specific, like for example, port functionality. So this is a bunch of syntactic sugar, this is format, this is regular expressions, this is you know, something about errors, a whole bunch of libraries that it depends on. Okay, so it has a set of exports. These are, these are the names that when you import the module are gonna get imported into your namespace and you will get access to them. So, for example, it exports HTTP get, HTTP head, this is, you know, like the HTTP land methods, and it exports functionality to manipulate the request object that gets returned by this HTTP stuff. So what's a request? That's a struct. So we have a full-blown object system that is based on Gambit structs, but the difference is that the type descriptor instead of being six fields long, it's actually 12 fields long. It's a type type, but it has extra information like methods. And we can define mixing with classes and all that, which is very close to what Loss can do, what Common Lisp can do. And we have that. 
Okay, so again, this is uh, actually I should go back into the code and remove that because at first structs were generative, but nowadays, you know, if they have struct, if it's at modern scope, it's no longer generated, it generates an ID based on the modern scope of the namespace. And structs can have a constructor, and otherwise, you just use make struct and you construct the struct, but here, here is a method that's a constructor. Things and I'm just going to show just we get this is a method. So we have keyboard arguments directly, not DSSL, but this is close to racket syntax for keyboard arguments and optionals. Okay, and that's about it about the details I want to show in here. So there is no code. This is how Gerbil looks like. So you can use define and you can use the normal scheme primitives, but we like to abbreviate things and use def and def struct and this instead of define struct. So don't be put off by that, it's still scheme. It doesn't matter what you call your special forms, it's the same language. Right. Yeah. So one of the special things that we have in there is, for example, this is the implementation of the actual HTTP request. So all the methods dispatch to this. So this is pattern restructuring. So we restructure a list to this after a regex match, and that's the implementation of the HTTP request. Okay, I'm not going to delve into the details. I'm going to use it a little bit later on the demo when I make a binary that actually is something like curl. All right, any questions so far about the structure of the code? Uh, the uh, module names, you go through the, the simple form and then the code implementation form and the quoted stream form. Uh, what's the point? What do you mean? Um, uh, module names, like on the on the beginning. <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. These, yes, these that's the packets. Models. The packages are. This is the prefix. So the packet's name is going to be std slash net slash request the module name, and the namespace is going to be std slash net slash request sar. And all the symbols defined in here will go into this namespace. Uh, so is the point with the colon to say that this is not a local module, but this one is supposed to be looked up in the package? Oh, uh, no, this is a declaration that the expander understands to construct the names when it expands. So it's keyword. So it's packets, just a normal keyword, and then the name of the packets. Right. If, right. You, if you remove the colon, for instance, in std slash format, what happens then? If you remove the column for packets, yeah. it's no longer a keyword, and the expander won't recognize it, and it will try to expand it as a normal symbol. Right, and then when import gets that symbol, what happens then? Yeah, uh, so yeah. here, these are module library paths. So basically, the column in the beginning of the module path, library path implies look it up in the module search path. So this module search path <coughs> is by default, you know, like gerbil installation, and the dot gerbil slash lib, and you can change that with environment variables, or you can add that programmatically if you want. So basically, the simple says look up in the standard library search path and look for gerbil gambit horse. So if for a head tags working in here, we could visit it directly. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, there are if I configure a list. Ah, uh, no, I didn't want to do that. Right, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so column prefix means which and symbol means which in import. So the column means search in the standard library path to try to load, you know, like a module that's defined in the lexical environment, a nested module. And gerbil gambit ports means look up in the file system in the search path under gerbil slash gambit in different directions slash port. So we actually open this file to take so a look at this. If you didn't have the colon, if you could look up for a local if module. It right? would look up for a local and module or a module that's available in your yeah. lexical yeah. environment, right? Ah, okay. It's an argument. Yes, you can I mean, do that with nested modules. So I'm going to show nested modules later. Yeah. If you have the colon. So this is the module that we have there. So what this is, what this does, okay, it exports everything, and it defines a bunch of symbol in the in the in the empty namespace. So 
I would assume that, that modules are self-contained except for two escape classes. So basically everything in the module must be defined and visible to the expander, otherwise it will give you an error about an undefined symbol. So this, in contrast to, error, to normal scheme, where you would simply have the error at runtime, the module is self-contained, but it has two escape classes. One is external, which basically just says, okay, this is something that's defined outside of this module. There is a, an object or a procedure with this name. We can access it. This allows us to do things like bootstrap and also refer to everything that's defined in the runtime. And the second escape class is fully qualified name. So if you use a fully qualified name, namespace, sharp, object name, then the expander will accept it and it will let you use that. So this allows us to use all the special gambit functions like the, the kernel primitives, like sharp sharp, continuation last. We can use that without having to define all the signals. All right. So we saw a module, which is a library module, but how about executable programs? Well, executable programs are just modules that happen to, uh, to export a main function. And then when you compile this with the XA or the static option, it just <coughs> executable. So let's look at an example program. This is actually the durable package manager, which allows you to do stuff like install packages or link packages. So it's a normal module in every respect of the word. The only difference is that it exports main. Okay, and because it can compile as a normal module, it also exports a bunch of other methods that, so that you can script the package manager if you want. So this is a nice stats in many senses. So what is main? What does main do? Okay, it uses the get opt library that defines a bunch of things for passing command line options. So we have a get opt library. And it simply dispatches on the command that we set. So let's use this command to actually install a, install a module, to install an external package. Okay, so, all right, what's going on with the durable home here? Yeah, this is Nix OS, so mm -hmm. I don't know what Foray is doing with this operating system. Let's <laughs> try <laughs> <laughs> to uh, uh, see if that uh, can be resolved. Uh, and this is just OK. OK, so that's fine. OK. I need to read some environment mm -hmm. files to uh, configure the real host interface. Do you have scheme variants of this too? Um, I, I mean, this is the uh, this is from Unix shell where you run this thing. Right? Can, can you do this from within the scheme too? Yes, of course. Well, that's because that's why I'm exporting all these symbols, extra symbols apart from main. So you can have a script that imports gerbil tools to the expected and you can do that from a script, for example. Okay. So now this will install an external package, and basically we now have gerbil lib to be. Which is a module uh, package that wrote for interacting with the libd to be daemon. So, in contrast to the modules, when you install a module, it always compiles it. So, we don't run the code from GXPKT. We simply install it and compile it. So, here we see you know, like that there is a bunch of library modules that were installed, like libd to be multi other. This is the sub module inside the package that implements multi addresses, which is the format used by libd to be for addresses. But it also compiled a few executables that you can run. So I have the code here for. We're going to open it in the MX. So one detail about what happens when we install something with gxpkg is that it invokes <coughs> the compiled script, which is basically something that uses the standard library build tool. So we have a build tool, so we don't have to use make. You can write your make files in scheme directly. And basically it tells you, it does a bunch of things that defines an executable script and all this stuff is what's compiled. 
Wait, I have a question. Why is this needed? Isn't this implied in the dependency graph? Well, it tells you how to build and what to build. Because, so basically, in a package is any GitHub repo hosted, so support GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket, that has a, a builder that says an enjoyable dirt package at the root. Linter construction can be arbitrary, okay? But so you need to tell it how to compile, and then what the namespace will be. So there is separation between the actual package and the namespace. The namespace is programmatically controlled, it's controlled by the programmer. There is a social contract that you should use, for example, your username on where to put in your libraries, but it's otherwise open to the program to how to do it. So we don't have an implicit naming based on the package. This is in contrast to what Frederick is doing uh, in Turkey in the GAM ecosystem. Okay, so we discussed a little bit about how modules look. They're normal scheme files, but the most important part about modules is the prelude. So what you know about the prelude is, is it's just another module. You can really use any module as a prelude. Okay, at the base, there is a, a special built-in into the expander module that acts as the prelude, the empty prelude. I'm gonna show what it looks like in a little bit. Okay, but by virtue of having, you know, like arbitrary preludes, this means that it can change the base language in any way imaginable. So you can do whatever you want with the base language, including changing the surface index. So since we installed gerbil.pkt, let's look at a, a module that actually uses arbitrary surface index. Well, and look at that. This is actually a portable file that happens to be a valid gerbil module. Why is that possible? So we have a special construct which is borrowed from Racket for modules that don't use the less expression reader, that use a custom syntax. So we do surplang and we define, we specify a module, and in this case, this is the protobuf library, which is part of the standard gerbil distribution. Okay, so if we switch to that, this is what the prelude looks like. So it imports a bunch of macros, it imports a bunch of things for the for phase one, which is basically compile time computation. So this is code that runs in the compiler but not in the runtime. And this includes specifying a grammar for passing. And the magic that happens is that you define a begin module, which is a special macro. If you define this macro, you're going to take complete control of the expansion of the module. You can do things like internal expansion and again change the surface, the, the semantics of the language, and perhaps make it not scheme. You can make a lazy language if you want. So the interesting part here is that the grammar is defined by another custom language. So we have an STD, we have a parser grammar inside mm -hmm. the standard library that allows you to define arbitrary syntax and EBNF. So this is the parser for protobuf. So as we can see, it's just EBNF. You know, it should be easy to read for anyone familiar with EBNF. And if we go back to Proto.SS, we'll see what happens is that the begin module, so, So how this works is that when the expander sees, you know, like a prelude, it sees whether it defines a read module body function for syntax, which is for the expander, and if it defines that, it calls it to read and parse the actual function and return to an S expression after it parses. So here the read module body just uses, you know, like parse protobuf, this was defined implicitly by the grammar. It parses that and converts it to a bunch of macros. So here we have a bunch of macros that do all the expansion for protobuf. So one feature that should be selling here is that we have a construct called begin syntax, which allows you to define code that's available to macros. So here is 
the, the, basic, the basic macro architecture defines the protocol which is that method that takes you know, the message declaration the message expression and generates structs and serializers in the protocol format for the structure that we define. So do you want to go through this macro a little bit? Or actually, we're going to discuss you know, some similar macros than this because you know, this one is a little complicated and does a whole bunch of things. <laughs> okay, so we showed custom preludes, but of course there is the core prelude that defines the core general language. This is the idiomatic dialect of scheme that you get by default. If you don't use, for example, schema seven arrays or another prelude, that's the language you're going to get. So this is the, the core prelude. This is this one uses the special built-in root prelude that only provides six hundred bindings. Which ones are those? So we can actually look at those. This is the core language. So these are the special forms that are defined. So they are in a special namespace in the, in the present namespace. And you know, these are defined in a way that you can, they're not defined down as symbols, they're only available to the expander. So these are the syntax expander. So the root prelude contains only this symbol with their expanders. And it does a couple of other things when initializing binding on the expand features, which is very important. So, so we have things like Jurgle on the expand Jurgle, Jurgle Gambit, and we have things like Linux, Windows, Mac OS X. So we can do conditional compilation based on that. So if we go back to the to the core prelude. This is a more complex module that actually has nested modules. And here is the language that we get. This is what we export. So the, run the import from the runtime module, sugar, the meta object protocol, macros, mats, some more sugar, and sugar for customizing import and export. So we have macros for import and export as well. And there is a bunch of things that is extended. This is what's available at three plus one, which is, you know, like, macros, macrology, and it has everything that's available at the runtime plus the expander runtime, syntax case, and some more syntactic sugar. And this form here provides a context one feature. This is provides your course so that this is what allows us to bootstrap. Because when it originally bootstrapped, I wrote a very limited subset of Jurgle for to write the expander and I wrote you know like a bunch of macros inside Gambit and I interpreted that and then I managed to interpret the compiler and then compile, and after that I compile the scheme with the expander and we don't need to do that anymore because we can actually bootstrap. So what's in the core language? Everything can run in R5RS, which is here in the module. A bunch of symbols from the host runtime, so these are all Gambit specific extensions, and you're going to get a couple for a few extra functions that are defined in a special, in a, in a random module called GX MC0, which gets loaded with executables. So this is regular Gambit code. It defines a bunch of things that are built in into uh, all the programs. Yeah, this is you know this is a kind of horrible hack for deciding where it is SMP because there are a lot of modules that are actually using internal Gambit constructs like the macro stuff. So we need to include Gambit SARP and when compiling we need to know whether we're SMP or not because there's a different representation of some structures, some methods are not there. So there is some tricks for dealing with SMP. So here is the module loading. So we have a registry for modules and we call load eventually, but we need to decide what this actual module is like. So this depends, you know, like in dot one, 
0.01.02 convention for compilation, so we can detect you know, like this situation and call load. <coughs> <coughs> so these are all the symbols that are available you know, like in the host runtime. This is stuff for the mob structs and classes. Mm -hmm. uh, wait, can I ask a namespace question? Yeah. Yeah. So from um, uh, what about uh, why doesn't the uh, Google just uh, kind of also generate namespaces according to some mechanism and then have like a state so that the compile the pre compiled the previously compiled module. So the problem with the auto generation is that you don't know what you're gonna get. So we leave it up to the programmer to specify, you know, like the prefix. So that when you're running the debugger inside the binary, you know how you can access your functions. You know how they are called. Right. Wait, what, when is when is this a problem? Because um uh, can Google do that? Management. I mean, so it's like I mean. Yeah, right. But because it's it corresponds to the file system structure, it needs to know the root of the priority. So what we do, we can auto generate. If you add the gerbil dot package file at the root of your hierarchy, it's going to auto generate. Mm -hmm. So in user code, we don't normally put the package declaration with the user gerbil package. But because this is the standard library, you know, like and there is no gerbil package there, and also this code predates the gerbil package, we do it explicitly. Mm -hmm. It's, it could be nice. Say, say that you have three modules, all of them have the name A, right? You have module A, A, and A. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. So you put them in a different place in the hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. So you have your table begins A, so you have directory A and then A, directory B and then A. So it's going to be directory A slash A sharp for the namespace. So mm -hmm. there's no conflict. Right. So there are also the reason that we allow custom namespace. Uh, there are things like the expander where I didn't want to actually know the actual file module, where it is. So here, the Jabil Expander actually has a GX namespace, which stands for Jabil Expander, so that we can define all these extends in the core for loot. Here for the Expander and the runtime. So here we say that all these are in DX namespace, and we have a whole bunch of things for processing syntax. So it's a pretty rich API, it allows you to do a lot of things. And then we define syntax case, which is actually a macro. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a little while. And you know, this is all the stuff that you get into the core language. So if you want to know what the core language does and what it looks like, just read the, read the prelude. And if you want to define your own language that has different things, just write a separate prelude. You can start from an existing preload, or you can start from scratch, and you can do anything you like. This is you know, you get a lot of powerful macrology into it. So one of my favorite micros here is the match macro. So here you see some classes defined. So we have built-in support for pattern destructuring. So the match macro is very fundamental to Jerbil because we use it a lot. And it's also optimized by the compiler. All right, any more questions about the corporate loop? So you can just read it. You know, you have fun with macrology. And as we said, you know, it's full of micros. So what is the basis of a microsystem? Because it's not syntax case. Syntax case is not a primitive in contrast to things like set. Okay, so it's based on quote syntax, which is what was the original graphic definition, still is. So basically, it's a construct that allows you to capture an identifier and syntactic callbacks. And on top of that, you can implement syntax case because then it becomes just another macro. Okay. And the whole essence of the macro system is that when you're running code in complex procedural macros, you can access the syntactic environment with the expander API. So you have things like syntax local value, and you can look up in, in the syntactic context what the binding for a particular object is, so that you can pass information between macros. So one of my favorite exercises is to actually show the implementation of syntax case. So this is syntax, the associated macro for syntax case. And This is syntax case. It's about 
there are kind of lines of code for the Cenex case. It's a very complex macro, but mm -hmm. you know, if you don't have it as a primitive, everything becomes much simpler. I, I'm not familiar with the, with referencing what is called cold syntax. So syntax case gives you more palatable Yes, it gives you, so yes, the Ristics Finder API, we, all, we already have things for processing syntax objects. Okay, and as we mentioned that in Connors to Racket, syntax objects can be unwrapped, you can get a list, and that's mainly about syntax object. But in order to deal with things like identifiers and things like have context and marks, you need a special API, and syntax case makes it easier because it uses a pattern language to, to distract your syntax. It's a canonical way for processing macros. I'm gonna show some more example of macros that use syntax case, and you can see how it's done. So here's an interesting thing. There is a, an underlying macro that's called for syntax case, which is a very restricted version of syntax case, which is used inside the expander itself. And this macro is defined in terms of syntax case. So when I did the bootstrap, I wrote core syntax case as a micro, and then I rewrote core syntax case using syntax case, and this is what you use post. That's the micro. <coughs> okay, so let's look at some more interesting micrology examples, because we've all only seen micrology that actually demands for loot and for language constructs, but that's something that the users use a lot. We use a lot of macros in Java to extend the language. Wait, if I could, is the macro spider preserving line numbers like it everywhere? Does, it does, it does, yeah. Wow, it's like everywhere. Yeah, yeah it does. Wow. Oh. <laughs> oh no. Hit control R and set control P. So let's look at an example that uses actual technology. So let's do a and one, two, two. So I'm going to show a little example. It's a client server. There is a server that actually uses, you know, like a object a key value store for storing data and associating these value keys. And there is a client that communicates with it over the wire and can access things. So let me build this. So there are two programs in here. There is KiwiStoreD, which is the server, okay? It's a binary that uses LMDB for storing the data, okay? And this is our, our main. So it, has, it uses getopt with a bunch of options and to just start an actor, it actually does start. And that's the client. So if I switch to our terminal, and I can say key store D. Whoa. Maybe just MK there or Oh Google. yeah, yeah, I have to generate my cookie. Yeah. How do I turn on turn off video mode so that I can open what's the key binding to stop the video modding video modding because oh, I don't oh, open. Control yeah, yeah. Because I don't want to open this.
these dendrites. So, uh, okay, so let's put something into our server and we say address and this is test. We'll do something. Oh, I'm guessing it's to be here too. And this win, this next west thing is really weird. Build slash user. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh yeah, and putting JSON files in here. Okay, I'm forgetting what the program is actually doing. <laughs> <laughs> I open the const compile. Is it still working? Yeah. All right. <laughs> That's your <wrote. laughs> Yeah, I wrote it, guys. <laughs> Yes, we specify a file. Maybe it's a good time for pizza. Yep. All the good time. Well, it's pretty much done. So. When we do that, it's like you just see in the cook pizza, and then it wants to put something into the <coughs> server, and we can actually retrieve it later on. And this is part of the database now. Help yourself to a pizza. So. The more interesting part is actually talk about the code that actually does all these things. Uh, there's something in my say in my the ensure use it while back to the ultimate even for all my emails. Actually, you can inform the, mo the module locally. That's, uh, for example, Steam Base, or for example, another example is underscore, uh, if I remember, underscore geyser. This is a model that could be informed but it does not use a unique uh, host name. So there is the host name host model and local I would love to un 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 understand what is Gerbil. <laughs> it's Define it. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. But that's the abstract sort for like a conceptual idea. What is it actually on a more kind of process level? Like what is the extent? So once you compile it, Gerbil disappears. Right. So it's a it's a macro expander. It's a micro expander, it's a standard model, it's, it's a compiler, it's a micro model system, it's a standard library. As I said, it's a metal language. And what state? <coughs> what state? What do you mean? 
so she right. not a dude from Black Hole in order to manage to the plane she plays as a dog. It's actually not mm -hmm. Fun, where it's yeah, traveling yeah, the yeah, mapping yeah. between yeah, like, yeah, the auto-generated and the like kind of no, tracking no, your project from the other. What state your gerbil have? Persistent state. Yeah. And drawn yeah. some state. Yeah, so yeah. 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 Okay, so does um, everybody have a pizza slice? I think you wait to get the pizza. All right, let's look at uh, some more micros that actually do practical things. So, how does the server and the client communicate? So, the server programs are actually using a protocol to communicate. So, we have protocol definitions here, and there is a micro called devproto that defines a protocol. So, what does this micro do? This is a very handy. So let's look at an actual macro that is used by user code and it's written in user code that's not part of the prelude, but it's actually doing something useful with computation. So this step proto thing starts with syntax case always. So it takes a proto ID and it gets a bunch of clauses. And then here it parses the protocol body. So this is a complex mac uh, intermediate macro, I would say. What this does is that basically defines the syntax. So it goes in and look, it processes syntax objects with syntax case and says, okay, we have an ID for a protocol. Let's do that. We have an extension for a protocol where we use an existing protocol to extend it. Okay? We have something like a call specifier that specifies that the followings are called because the RPC system, the actor RPC system, allows for two things either calls or events. Calls have a return value or an error, while messages are one way. So the macro parses using syntax case. And then it generates the vertical info. So it generates a whole bunch of new identifiers. For every call that we have, we, it generates a couple of macros that are doing stuff. So these are all introduced identifiers. So we're breaking hygiene here and we're introducing identifiers into our program. Uh, I have a really silly question. In the format notation, which is screen layer, this is just a totally ridiculous perspective question. But do, do you have any facility for generating on compile time those two like scheme optimized, compile time optimized variants? Or are they distinct parts on runtime? What do you mean by that? Oh, yeah. So you see there, the format screen, the tilde A, dot tilde A. Yes, these are names that we're going to introduce. Cool. Okay, these are a convention. So when you define a protocol, and you have a bunch of messages, so there is a whole bunch of things that are defined. So messages are represented by structs. Okay, so we define the struct, and we have macros for sending and receiving those structs. Okay, so if we go back into our PB store client, what it does is that it uses one of these macros that got generated. So this is the bang bang PB store boot for putting something. Okay, so. If we go back to Matt, so this is a call ID, and this is what it does. That's what goes into a call. So that's the macro that it's using. And store server using one or another magical macro which is the receive message macro which is basically does pattern matching on things defined by the protocol so if we look at do this macro
again, it's a more complex macro that it basically expands to things that do things with thread received and thread sent and I'm winning the mail box. So for example, here is how you receive a message. So we take it from the, from the mailbox and then you match them to that. And we use syntax parameters. Oops, I didn't want to do that. To pass information between macros. So when you're receiving a message and you're in reaction context within the uh, less than does construct, you can automatically infer the sender of a message and send a message back. And these are syntax parameters. So there are a couple of interesting features in this file. So for example, it's a class. So these are objects that are part of the class. There is a function for looking them up and getting the value. And here's a method that makes it a macro itself. So the class can be a macro itself. So any object can be a macro, not just procedure, as long as it has an apply macro expander method. So that's, this allows you to do some really interesting things. So you can define syntax and you can have a complex structure that has a lot of stuff. Here in the parameter, we have a few things. But if you define a method into that object, then you can actually use it as a macro everywhere, not just the value that you pass around. So at the same time, you can, from another macro, you can use index local value to look up this object and you can access it and you can get stuff out of it. So as you can see, there is no limit in what you can do with the macro system. So it's just very, very handy. Yes. All right, so enough with macrology. Okay, so anyone who's interested who can actually read the expander sources, it's pretty short, it's all written in jargon. Let's see what happens. So, a little bit about what comes with the standard library. So there are generics, there are actors, HTTP client and server, databases, key value stores, cryptography, things like JSON, YAML, and XML, OS interface through raw devices. So there's a lot of stuff in the standard library, but the philosophy is if something is useful for practical programming, we add it. So if you find something that's useful in your programs, Yes, you can make a package and you can tap them your own uh, libraries. But if you think it's generally useful, just open a PR, we'll add it. Okay, we're very open to that. We, we're not trying to keep some pure aesthetic value. We want to have something that is maximally practical and useful to people for real world programs. Okay, so this basically ends the overview part of the doc. So has this clarified at all how how Jabber looks and how it behaves. So a lot of it's about macrology. But it's macrology not as an, as an end, but it's a, it's a means to an end. So it's macrology for molding the language to their own needs. Okay, so, so far we've seen a language that looks alien, but everything compiles down to Gambit, okay? There is a compiler that takes the expanded source, does a bunch of transformation and optimizes Jabber idiom. So we don't do any optimizations that GSC is gonna do or not gonna duplicate one. We do, we do some optimizations that are very important for Jerry. For example, direct dispatch of case lambdas. We use a lot of case lambdas, optional argument lambdas, and keyword lambdas. So these are directly optimized by the compilers where it goes directly to the branch of the case lambda when it knows, when it sees a direct call. So we optimize maths because maths is used throughout so the match expansion is relatively simple, it doesn't try to be too smart, but the compiler that takes that and transforms to something that's much more, that's much more faster. But the key here is, as I said, is how we do the naming. So when you define something on a Jabber module, it's called foo, it's not gonna be called foo down at the Gambit level, it's gonna be namespace start foo. Okay, and I should also add that at any point in any module, if you wanna use raw Gambit code, you're very welcome to do that. We have a special form called Begin Foray, and the code that goes in there, it's unprocessed by the expander, it gets fed directly to GSA. So if you need, you know, you do things like, I don't know, whatever you want to do in plain Gambit, like FFI, we just do it through the Begin Foray. Okay, so 
But we're going to compile our artifacts when we compile a module. So when we compile a module, there's a whole bunch of things that gets generated. So we have the, everything goes into the gerbil path, which is by default is tilde.gerbil slash lib. And under that, it, it generates a bunch of files. So this, the underscore underscore t, this is the render loader. You can use this to load a module and all its dependencies. <coughs> the module such a, Cast as zero, that's the runtime code for the module. This is what you get at runtime. This is what runs at runtime. And there is a whole bunch of sections which is expansion time module. So I'm going to show an example right away. And there is also the module.ssi. This is a reduced scheme interface that basically has definitions and pointers to macros, and this is loaded by the expander. Okay, and there is an extra file when you're compiling with optimizations, which is the optimizer interface. It has things like declarations, you know, like arities. So we do arity checking as we add that because this is one of my favorite features. The compiler, when compiling with optimization, will arity check all direct faults and fail if you're calling something with the wrong arity. This saves you a lot of time in, from debugging in your code. Uh, uh, wait, is this the output? Are those the files that? Gerbil yes. will output and have a state. Yes, this right. is the state. So like the interface, that's like as when Gerbil has processed the module, it figures out which are the exports. Yes, and yes. Let's, let's uh, look at uh, the actual example. That's much better. So I'm passing a couple of flags to tell you to keep scheme source and don't compile the module right now. And I'm telling you to put the out in JXE out. And let's compile the requests to the sales module. And here, so it follows the packet structure. So it goes under STD, net, and here is the request. Oh yeah, I forgot to compile with optimizations. So this is the runtime code. This is what is going to run. This is the actual Gambit code that's going to run at the runtime. And when you are building executables, this is the code that's going to be linked in. OK? So as you can see, everything got namespace. So at first, I was thinking about using the namespace declaration. But then uh, since we have all the, all the information already, we don't need to do that. We can namespace things ourselves. But this also means that if you have this module, you can import it from you can depend on it on normal Gambit code, and you can use the namespace declaration and have access to all the runtime symbols. So if you have, you know, like a normal Gambit program that wants to use gerbil programs, you can do that. It's straightforward. So there's, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of things. So make struct field accessor. So this is a procedure for the accessor when the compiler sees extract access, it inlines this to structure left directly. So you don't pay you know, like any penalty for using structs. So this is all just code, lots of code. So we have a little problem that we would like to solve is that as part of by product of the expansion is that the name of the of the variables, of the local variables, has been gen synced and degen synced. So this loses some information, you know, against source debugging. So when you do source debugging, you're going to see some ugly local variable names. We don't know how to solve this yet. But as you can see, it's just scheme code. Okay, so here's code that goes into the expander then, this is what gets loaded by the expander. So if you're in the interpreter and you have some dependencies, for example, we define the struct, we define this index object. So this is the code that's gonna get loaded by the expander and the compiler. So these are a little more amplified. So you get this, uh, this one on the namespace appended, which is basically telling you that this is a phase one of the expansion. 
And you can see that the compiler optimized the make track stuff to make structures directly. And this is stuff that gets loaded when the expander gets available. So back to your question about state. Oh, this is the runtime loader. So if you want to use it from through a normal gamut module, so you can just load the underscore underscore RT. And it's going to load all the dependencies. So you're going to need the load module function, which is basically accomplished by linking in GX comes in zero. This is provided by GX comes in zero. And after it loads all the dependencies, it loads the module runtime load. And this is what the expander interface looks. This is a file that gets loaded by the, by the compiler and the expander when you're importing the module. So this is the, the low level language, fully expanded Jerry. So the interesting part is that when the expander loads this SSI, so because it can load source and compile code as well, the SSI is treated as a normal scheme source and it's passed through the expander and then when you evolve the module because you need it at time, it's going to call load module and it's going to get the runtime code in there. And this is information that gets you know, passed into the optimizer. So for example, we have the clerk type that says, okay, this is the type ID and this is a struct that has eight fields and it has a constructor so that we can optimize the code to constructor and we can have direct dispatch on the constructor. And here is something that says HTTP get is a keyword lambda, okay, that accepts these keywords, and this allows us to optimize this path for keyword lambda. So when you're calling something with keywords, the compiler is going to see that and it's going to dispatch directly bypassing all the keyword parsing. And here is some plain lambdas. So what we declare here is yeah, yes, this is a lambda. This subref here means there's no inline information. And this is the RID of the Lambda, which allows us to RID check. So <coughs> any questions here? Uh, I heard the word inlining. Do you have an inlining uh, keyword that inlines a function? Uh, no, we don't have an inline keyword, but we have a def inline macro that's going to inline for you when you're using it. So okay, what, it's kind of the same. Yeah, it's a macro that basically inlines and makes the Lambda and calls it. Okay, but the compiler does do some inlining. So if things are realizes of other things, it does do some inlining. And it does inlining of all the struct operations, which are very important. What can you say that again? The struct operations, so oh, struct no, accessors, struct, struct, struct mutators, struct constructors, all this is in, in line because structs are very important. And mm -hmm. if yeah. you don't inline them, you get a severe performance penalty. If you inline them, you can use sharp sharp structs to ref directly into the generated code. Mm -hmm. so, so let's look at an example here. So here is, this was inlined directly. This was a, a request, what is the name? The name, I don't know which one it was actually. So it's the request uh, structure F, I can call that one name. Oh no, this eagle mode thing. <laughs> right, so there was a request status. So this request status got inlined into a structure ref. So this has the best of both worlds. So you can use the accessors as first class objects and first class procedures and you can pass them around. But when you're doing direct calls to them, it bypasses it completely and calls it. So any other questions here? Uh, 
when you think about the modules, how many module namespaces do you have? You have like lo local scope, which is like conceptual module named by symbol, and then you have like file name scope. Yeah, it's, uh, you should think of a, of a base module as a file. So the fundamental unit is the files and the assets. Yes, yeah, so we can have, you know, like nested modules that are created inside a file module and or they're created in the interpreter, but fundamentally we'd like to map a module to a file. <coughs> so when you make an import form, do you normally just write the symbol name as in like space? Uh, fancy this well, import let's space. look at the code. Okay. Uh, the code for the import. That's the loader. So all the imports translate into this, into loading the modules at runtime. This is what gets loaded in the module. So we have an import for get will come with ports. It's gonna load the underscore underscore RT, which eventually it's gonna call the runtime code if there is any, if there is any. All right, so executables. That's not like the potatoes and meat. We have a compiler, we're going to be able to make executables. So there are two types of executables in general. One is dynamic executables and the other is static executables. There is a very subtle difference between them. Dynamic executables are basically stubs that call into the compiled modules. So this allows you to just have dynamic to use a dynamic loading system and to have very short compilation times. So that means you can just say, okay, load the module and, and evaluate a bug. That's what it does. So I'm going to show you like a little bit of, of a demo of that. The downside of that is that they're slower than static executables because you can do all the fancy optimizations and they require a job distribution. Well, that's not going to apply if you want to see binaries to your server. So we have static executables, which what it does is that it takes all the code for all the modules, it lumps it together. So this was actually suggested by Mark when we discussed about how to do for program optimization. It uses the magic optimized dev definitions, which is the tree savior. Okay, and voila, you get an actual binary which is independent of the variable distribution. <coughs> so the downside is that it has long compilation times because the tree savior has to do for, for static executables, but it's worth it. So when you're doing development and you're testing something locally in the binary, then just compile a dynamic executable. When you say, okay, I want to ship this to the server, compile the static executable instead of taking one second, it's going to take 30 seconds. All right, let's actually do an example here. Nick Choves is not ready for static executable. Okay, what's wrong? Uh, you need uh, to have static library for dependent Okay, okay, when I say static executable, so there's still going to be some dependence on the foreign libraries that you have on the ESO. So if you want to have to do, if you want to have a fully static binary, you just pass a, a dust static in the in DSC. Okay, so you can have static binaries, you know, like in NixOS, but just need to have DSOs for the foreign libraries. So you don't have to compile fully static at the C level. Okay. So where should I put this? Can I throw in another question? Yes, of course. <laughs> and this is a really, really unlike question. No, no, all right. But like a symmetric question. Dot SS, is that the racket is? The it means skin source. Say it uses the same extension. Who? It's not just racket. Racket uses RK key nowadays. It doesn't use SS anymore. Oh, could, could I configure it to SCM? Yes, you can for the compiler, but if you want to load in the expander, it doesn't currently recognize the ACM extension for loading, but that's an easy fix. Uh, I'm going to do it because there's people asking for it. So you should be able to use SCM. So the reason I chose SS over SCM is I want to distinguish between, you know, like gerbil code and vanilla skin code. This is what gets fed to the gambit.
So let's do a very poor man's curl, okay? So we get this. Yeah, I'm just gonna put it on display a lens right now. But yeah, we should, we should put it on the rest of the air. If we I was doing actually curl, I would be more careful about that. <laughs> ah, we get a song inside him. Good meat. Not finally we can do it. Oh yes. Sorry about that. Do you need to be a We have a curl here. So now that the interesting part is I want to look at both what happens in the dynamic executable and what happens in the static executable. So if I do gc dash x a dash s dash s dash dash s Can you use this for cross-platform compilation to be toy with it, like compiling for Android or whatever? Uh, that's something that is not very well supported yet, but if you compile with him, you can cross-compile. So we're going to eventually have cross-compilation directly supported if you have uh, the relevant versions of Dynamic installed. So here's what happens in Dynamic Executable. Okay, It includes a small stub. Let's look at this stub, actually. So this is what it defines. So basically it loads the gerbil runtime libraries. Okay, it loads the runtime. It hooks the exception handler so that we can have nice exceptions with methods. Okay. And it's just called GX start. So this is what the dynamic executable does. Okay, so that's the stub. The module is compiled and it's available in your gerbil path and it calls start. Now if we were to compile A static executable, which is what the end product is usually are. So if you want to ship something to your server, you really want the static executable. So So what happened here is that we include uh, the base of the runtime, six comes at zero. Okay, we include a star for static executable, which is much simpler than the dynamic executable star, which only it only defines an exception handler, has an exception handler. Okay, it includes a dependency. So here they are all, all in the order of definition. So we have transitive dependencies by using SD requests. So it's a whole bunch of includes in here. And in the end, it includes the compile code for your for your actual file, for your executable file, and it calls main with the command line. That's what it does. So thanks to the FreeSaker, this doesn't result in a huge blow of the executable. So it's very effective. Oh, by the way, Mark, I found a bug in the FreeSaker. If something is defined for in as with a C defined, so it's called by C, the FreeSaker won't see it. That's something that someone ran into. 
Okay, so the reason for repeating all the declarations in here between includes is because modules can have declares. We don't have the declarations to link from one module to another. So there is no canon to a scope declaration form, and the absence of that, we repeat the declarations with all declarations after it's included. Questions? How large is this? Well, let's see. So it takes a few seconds to compile this study because it's a lot of code that it has to link in. That's that's the downside. What well, um, can you work without the main procedure thing? I mean, in, in yeah. Well, somebody asked me about that. Why do we have a main? So, whoa. Oh yeah, we need to pass some of the options. So the reason I didn't want to <coughs> do it without the main function is that when you have a dynamic executable, the code will let, would execute in the context of the loader. I want to be outside the loader when I start main. I mean, of course you can have code that's going to execute. You know, like when the module is loaded, if you have code spliced in there, it's going to execute before main. Wait, wait, wait. So you make a difference between like loader phase and main execution phase. Yes, for the dynamic executable, because it has to load the module. So if you if we didn't have a main, then your code would execute at the context of the loader, which is undesirable. Uh -huh. Wait, wait, wait. Say that you would have a main file that you call main.scm, right? That the whole dependency graph, right, is going to be kind of behind it. Main scm is going to be the last piece to be loaded. Yeah, okay, you, ju you just export the main function. You just find an export file. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, if you have a main.xm, the whole dependency graph is going to be behind it. So all of that would have been ready to already. So like, the yes, that's fine. But in a, a dynamically loaded executable, your code would execute inside the load module. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. some uh -huh. may right. not see uh, this as a problem, but I see it as very undesirable because you know it changes the context of the evaluation. Yes, I have exactly the same problem. Because it's under, it's like really very nice if load module can return the field if there's still or like it's better than main execution. So what what's in the context? I mean, what what's the point for that? Yeah. So oops. So it's not very big. It's five hundred kilobytes thanks to Chris Hager for the static scale. that scale. So how big is it? How much we should? Just about so four or five megabytes, probably. Yeah, that's the static one. Yeah, that's the static one. So the tree shows the tree show the gambit runtime also. The what? The gambit runtime also went through this tree show here. Correct. How are you compiling gambit in uh, NixOS? Are you doing enable cert or are you or without enable cert? Um, enable what? Which? Are you using enable cert? Uh, you can. You sure. can. Yeah. Well, actually, there's a very easy answer to yeah, that. LDD on it. So yeah. If you're static. So lib gambit at auto so was not linking. Yeah. Yeah. So for the servers, you really want to compile without an enable search. So the gambit runtime goes in there. So then you have the gambit runtime plus the extra load that you take. Okay. Questions. Right, let's switch back to presentation mode. So that's about it. So if you want to find out more, we have a very nice documentation site that could be better actually put together first at Tons.io. Okay, so if you want to get the source code, it's on GitHub. And if you want to, if you want help or chat with other girls, just open to IRC. We're, we're all there.